Please stay with Alexa Clay. Alexa, how are you doing? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. Thanks for joining me today. Um, culture hacking. What? Tell me, what is it? Why, <laughs> what, 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 tell me about the ideology. Yeah, I mean, so first off, both my parents are anthropologists. So, you know, they studied cultures around the world. My mom actually went around interviewing people that thought they'd been abducted by aliens. Uh, so that was kind of a trippy experience as a child. Uh, yeah. But I always grew up with this idea of um, cultural observation, cultural analysis. And for me, um, you know, coming into kind of my own intellectual journey, culture hacking represented a provocation for thinking about how we don't see culture as preserved, as homogenous, but culture as something that is living, that's able to be hacked, that's able to be changed, that's able to be disruptive. And so when I talk about culture hacking, I talk about hacking the cultures of huge Fortune 500 companies. You know, how do we get these companies to be more human? How do we overcome some of the hurdles that bureaucracy imposes on us? Um, or culture hacking can also be um, you know, an open source community that finds really different avenues for thinking about sharing uh, information, sharing in innovation, um, and not not being proprietary around IP, right? And so I think it's culture hacking can really be applied in any kind of context where you feel like the status quo is not sufficient. Um, and there's a set of rules and behaviors and mindsets that need to be overthrown. And so, so tell me kind of, especially you mentioned obviously four to 500 companies where the culture and everything about that company might be steeped in history and mm. people join it because of what they perceive and then realize it's what they perceive is not the reality. Kind of are there steps and are there ways that change, I suppose, kind of can happen without kind of everyone being fearful of it? Yeah, totally. I mean, I think so much, so many of us experience that, right? We we um, go into these institutions, these companies, these organizations, and then they have a legacy culture that really isn't alive or that's preventative of a lot of innovation, of entrepreneurship. In some ways, these companies are out of touch with their hustler's instinct, right? And so a lot of the people that I work with, I call sort of misfits on the inside or tempered radicals. They're people that are um, really aggressively trying to develop new products and services for these companies, new ways of working, new processes. Uh, someone, for example, who's uh, in the business of uh, making cars will suddenly bring this disruptive business model of let's think about car sharing. Let's think about getting involved in transport aside from just automobile manufacturer. So a lot of the people that I enjoy working with are these entrepreneurs that are you know, really coming into conflict with some of the sacred cows of their institutions and finding ways of navigating around those rules. And so um, part of it almost feels like this kind of Alcoholics Anonymous group where you're bringing together these misfits and they're yeah. sort of they're self-identifying and they're saying, I'm trying to create change from within. And then the practice of that is having solidarity with others, becoming well-networked, understanding how change happens within your organization, finding senior champions and mentors uh, that can help you navigate um, that change. And these are people that are really long-term often in their outlook. And so they're trying to bring these business models that are 10, 15, 20 years when a lot of the performance of these companies are judged on quarterly returns. Yeah. So, you know, I, it's it's a hard task to be sure. But tell me kind of, and obviously you use the term misfits kind of, which I find really fascinating in the sense of surely businesses should realize that these are the people who are going to drive them forward in the world that we now live in um mm. and this whole fear of change that lives in in businesses do you think there's any sign of them understanding that actually the misfit the misfits are going to rule the world type of scenario yeah, I mean, I think more companies, you know, for example, I did a lot of work exploring black markets, underground markets. And so as part of my speaking tour, I brought King Tone into conversation with companies who was a former mm. Latin king, a gangster. And, um, you know, just bringing really, you know, unique individuals into these corporate contexts. And by the end of it, you know, he was talking to like pharmaceutical execs. He was talking to people in um, fast moving consumer goods companies and really brought a different perspective in. And I think, you know, I think when we think about non-traditional hiring, um, it's it's around how do you bring people that have kind of neurodiverse skill sets. Um, so many of the people that are in our prison system today as well 
um, are incredible entrepreneurs. King Tone was, you know, ran a, a local gang organization, and yet he's one of the most charismatic leaders that I've come across. He was trying to transition the gang organization to be much more like a social movement, to be an incubator for skill development amongst at-risk youth. And so I think I think too often we're in these echo chambers and these bubbles. We hire people that are very similar to us. And so I think one of the easy kind of wins for a lot of companies is actually to focus on building a pipeline of more diverse talent, bringing in external voices that can sort of shake things up um, and, you know, people from some of the markets that you're trying to reach. And can I, and can I, I mean, it's it genuinely fascinating. I think how much, like over the last three, how many years, kind of the, the polarization of society has become such more entrenched in how we are. Mm. How much does that need to move for this to be more embedded in us naturally? Or are the two things completely distinct? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a huge component to it is we've become so much more tribalistic, right? And so, you know, but I think to some extent, the universality of the pandemic and what everyone experienced with COVID, I think led people to also want to reach out a bit more and to come up, um, you know, once we actually got to be in society again, walking around, interacting with people where people weren't just vectors of disease. Um, I think there was this genuine desire to connect with people that were really different and living different experiences. And I think the story of the pandemic was kind of a story of haves and have nots in terms of the kind of wealth accumulation that we saw, um, you know, of a lot of people that weren't supported by, you know, a social safety net and had a very different experience. Um, the kind of the need to completely rethink our educational systems during this time. So I think everyone's coming off of an experience, um, you know, where we've had to reimagine society and reimagine kind of our roles in society, even the informality of being on Zoom and doing everything virtual. People had to show up more as themselves. Um, mm -hmm. You know, the sort of performance and mass that we often wear when we go into work um, was something that people could sort of take off. And so, you know, I think we're in a really interesting moment now of sort of people are, are rethinking how to exist, you know, in a collective and what society actually means. And I think there's this hunger and thirst to be around people that are different from us um, and that share different views. And do, you, and do you think as we return, kind of as we'll, hopefully we're getting there to the face-to-face -face and that we are going to continue down that path or is there a fear for you that we're going to regress back into what we know and comfort and safety and safety net i don't think so i don't think we'll retrench into kind of our little bubbles um i think you know what i've seen is um you know people really want an experience beyond their their micro world mm -hmm. um you know even just talking to strangers you know the impetus behind my book the misfit economy was i want to talk to people that make me uncomfortable i want to talk to somali pirates and gangsters and uh, con artists. And I want to know, you know, what they're doing that's creative, that's entrepreneurial. What are the practices that they use? How did they come to do what they do? Um, and so I think, you know, so many of the people that we sort of other, I think we need to bring sort of nearer and dearer in, into dialogue, into conversation. And that's what I kind of, I suppose, one bit of practical advice from you, hopefully putting you on the spot, kind of, for people who are in organizations and kind of big organizations and they're feeling like they want to get out they not they want to get out sorry they want they want their views and their thoughts which is slightly different to be to be able to have a voice to them what do they need to do how can they pluck up courage to speak out and not feel like they're being they're coming across as a fraud or not knowing what they're doing um is there something they can take that you can advise for them to take those initial baby steps yeah, I mean, I think just how to, how can we be more courageous at work? I think, you know, what does love look like at work? I think love is often an emotion we just assign to sort of a significant other or a partner. But, you know, what does love look like at work? I think also, you know, so much of the work I've done with alter egos is about cultivating aspects of yourself that are often dormant in different contexts. And so, mm -hmm. you know, if you feel like you show up at work every day and you kind of have this um, really perfectionist streak, or you have, um, you know, a spirit that's always trying to be like disruptive or the naysayer. It's how do you overturn that? How do you experiment in meetings with showing up as different parts of yourself? And I think so, so much of the time, you know, the self is sort of this 
um, you know, this timeshare, we sort of choose who the self is, who we construct as part of our work identity. And so, you know, play with elements that are different, like try and be someone who's extremely um, laid back at work for one day in a meeting, see how that goes. Maybe that creates a field that's much more generative for connection, for collaboration. Um, so I think part of it is just about sort of disrupting the sort of identities that that we wear. And I think people are sick of the, the sort of falsity of work identities and wanting mm -hmm. to get into, into new kinds of personalities. So I think that's one, one sort of constructive and playful exercise that we can do. I think another component of it too, is find the other misfits, find people that make you more, you know, find your tribe at work, find, find that subculture at work that helps um, to nourish your ideas. And so a lot of it is around sort of that movement building piece within organizations that you can, you can actually be a movement builder within in your organization um, for that higher aspiration, for that change. Alexa, on that empowering note, thank you so much indeed for your time. It's been a pleasure speaking to you. Genuinely thought provoking, so I really enjoyed it. Um, have awesome. a good day. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Nick. Take care.